We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Return of the Secaucus 7 on September 5th, 1980. It was edited and produced and written and directed by John Sayles and released by Libra Film. This film was shot on 16mm in 25 days on a budget of $60,000. Sales saved a lot of money by renting a ski lodge in the off-season for the cast to work and live in for the duration of the production. Sales self-financed the film with money he made selling scripts like The Howling and Piranha for Joe Dante and Alligator and Battle Beyond the Stars are an extra view for Roger Corman. Sales taught himself how to edit on an editing suite he rented and installed in the home he shared with actress Maggie Renzi. According to Film Threat, this film was the first successful American independent film to attract wide attention without the benefit of shock value, intense theatrics, or snob appeal. Whatever that means. I don't know. I feel like this movie's got a lot of smug in it. Yeah, I was going to say. If anything, <laughs> Maybe it's smug that last and one. snob are different. It became a hit on the art house circuit and opened the door for an entire movement of independent filmmaking. This is a feature film debut for director John Sayles. And Lawrence Kasdan insists that he hadn't seen this movie when he sat down to write The Big Chill. Still, Sakaka 7 is considered the first of the modern wave of friend reunion movies. Is this anything? I've never seen The Big Chill. Is this like that? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's just a bunch of friends meeting up for the first time in a long time at a house that they're sharing. Huh. I always thought it was like a mobster movie because I figured people were, you know... Nope. Put him on ice. <laughs> I forget why it's even called the Big Chill. Because there's a dead guy. Okay. <laughs> what does that have to do with the Big Chill? That's the Chill. He's on. He is. He is he on. Is he's on in ice. the morgue. <laughs> he's dead and buried before the movie starts. Really. He's chilling underground. All right. Because it takes place in winter. <laughs> Every movie that takes place after a person dies could be called that. Then. We open with what looks like mug shots of a group of people looking into camera and in profile. The last of the seven faces is smiling straight ahead under the title card. And our first actual shot is of Mike plunging a toilet while his wife or girlfriend, I'm not clear, Katie, makes a bed. They're preparing for other guests and they're not sure how this particular couple, Irene and her new boyfriend Chip, get along. And they debate putting the mattress on the floor because sometimes the box spring collapses. And they're worried about them uh, being a little too amorous. Right. Mike fixes the toilet. Francis pulls over to pick up hitchhiking JT and his acoustic guitar. He tells her that he scraped money together and he's headed back to Los Angeles soon. Back at the house, we learn through conversation that Mike and Katie rent this lodge every summer and they're trying to decide who to put where and mention that Irene used to date JT, which could make things interesting. We see Irene and Chip on the side of the road poring over a map to figure out where they are and Irene asks if it'll be weird to hang out with her ex. It's not going to bother me if it's not going to bother you. Well, it's not going to bother me. It's just that there are a lot of loose ends lying around. Franconia, that's where we are, just south of Franconia. I mean, it's a little weird. We had this real nightmare of a relationship, but I'm always glad to see him. Mike is at a theater picking up tickets to a show starring their friend Lacey Summers tonight. She left a bunch of comps for them at the box office, and so he's just here collecting them. I feel like... I lose track, well, or I, I, at this point in the movie, I have no idea who is supposed to be, like, a main character. Yeah. Because we jump back and forth between so many people, and it turns out some of the people that we introduce early on have nothing to do with the main seven group of friends, and so it's all very confusing. Well, I think, I think there's basically seven main characters of the movie. Yeah, but you don't really actually finally establish who they are until almost the end of the movie. That's true. Mike gets back to the cabin just as Francis and JT are showing up. Katie and Francis talk about Chip. Uh, that's Irene's new boyfriend. And Francis says that he seemed straight, but she doesn't explain much more than that. He works for the senator with Irene, who has also straightened out a bit uh, since the good old days. But they don't, they don't have a good feel for Chip yet. Back out on the road, we see Chip is reading the instructions on how to change a tire 
while Irene is seated on the ground rolling up her sleeves. She asks if he's nervous about meeting her friends, and he is. She's using her fingers to try to take a lug nut yeah. off of the tire, like, like legitimately Which will work trying. if she put this tire on in the first place. Yes, yeah, you only put them on finger tight, right? Yeah. <laughs> Katie tells Francis back at the house that she couldn't help but notice that she brought her diaphragm. Francis is a doctor, or in medical school maybe, and lists off all the shitty side effects of pausing your uterus with chemicals, and Katie totally understands. Back at the gas station, Irene looks away for a second and is surprised to find Ron, an old friend, sitting on the hood of her parked car suddenly. Ron seems to know Mike and Katie and predicts that this is who Irene is here to visit. Irene tells Ron that she's a speechwriter for a senator now, and he asks if Francis will be there. And when he learns she will, he says that he'll see them later. Once everybody gets to the cabin, Chip gets a very mild introduction. Irene asks what's the story with Jeff and Mara, the last couple they're expecting, and apparently they're going to be here late, probably tomorrow or the next day, because they had to stop for a 35th wedding anniversary for Jeff's parents. Chip asks if Jeff and Mara are the teachers, and Mike says, no, that's us. Mike explains that they're basically allowed to teach anything in public schools as long as the kids don't kill each other. He starts the year with the Boston police strikes, and then quizzes all of these adult friends here about it. They joke around playing students and teachers for a bit until Katie points out that the kids are much shittier now and school is mostly discipline at this point. So up until this point, nothing has really happened except everybody has shown up. Yeah. And nothing is really going to happen. That's true. And not even everybody has shown up. Yeah, that's true. It's really one of those kinds of movies that I just It's your favorites. (laughs) I I, I was like, I I have very little notes because I don't know what to say because... There's nothing to say in a lot of scenes. It's yeah. A lot of scenes, it's just them talking about stuff. And it's interesting, I guess, to them because they're talking about things that they did. But we haven't seen the things that they have did. We've only heard about it. Well, yeah. and 90% of the dialogue in this film is just how they relate to one another. So they, they just keep relaying you know how their Who, what does this person think about that yeah, person and, and 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 how do i know you and let's explain that all to chip and let's explain you know the the past and the history and all this stuff it's really just it's so all of it is so irrelevant it doesn't it's, matter it seems to me like a an early precursor to the whole mumblecore movement of all these movies where it's like well you have sixty thousand dollars to make your movie with okay then it's just going to be characters and character building and people talking to each other that's all you have I don't even understand how you can write a script like that. You know, in my minimal script writing experience, I just don't even understand how you can write a script that doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end. A script that doesn't have an arc. A script yeah, how that do you decide have... where to stop it? Well, yeah, and what is the next scene? You aren't progressing any story whatsoever, so how do you decide what comes next? I think you literally decide by when you get to page 100, find a good breaking off point, and that's the end of your story. I guess. They get arrested. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> the end. That's not the end. They all sit outside in a row of chairs and make fun of Lacey's play tonight until the phone rings and Katie gets up to answer it and Mike says, if it's Ron, tell him I'm out shopping. JT hasn't seen Ron in a long time and doesn't understand why everyone's shitting on him. Uh, but they all just kind of say that he's not the same person that he was in high school. Irene mentions that she saw him at the gas station and... Someone else mentions don't get him started about snowmobiles because he goes to like a snowmobile convention every Mm -hmm. year and he can't stop talking about them. I don't really understand why everyone's shitting on him. Like even throughout the rest of the course of the movie. Yeah, I guess occasionally he gets excited about snowmobiles, but that's nothing to like be mean to somebody about. I think it's just that they don't have any shared interests with him anymore. Well, and he also, I mean, I think two of the other characters did too, but he stayed in the town. Like, yeah. Right, like just him and Mike and Katie, basically. Yeah. But I actually really like his explanation for yeah, why no. he stayed. Yeah, I it's think great. He's he's a fine guy, and I don't think that it's very. I think a lot of the people in this movie are kind of mean. <laughs> yeah, um, Katie comes back from the phone call, and it was Mora. Turns out she and Jeff broke up, and she just got off the bus at Six Thousand Salad Bowls, 
<laughs> <laughs> which is just a cool name for a place i love this name for a place but also the fact that i was watching the end credits and there was a special thanks to six thousand salad bowls which means which i'm guessing like everything in this place it is just a real place yeah. in this town <laughs> at first i thought that, that it was an inside joke that they had that the address was six thousand and it's just called salad bowls <laughs> but they call it six thousand salad bowls but that's the actual name of the restaurant yeah but Mike has to head back to the theater, which I guess is walking distance from their lodge anyway, and buy an extra ticket for Mora because they weren't planning on having her with them tonight and they don't have a comp for her. So uh, they go and pick her up, and before they get back to the house, she asks if JT made it out. She's very interested if JT is around, and we cut immediately to them hugging enthusiastically at the house. Before the show, Chip asks Francis if Lacey is any good, and Katie jumps in to say that she sucks. Oh. <laughs> like, outside the theater. Yeah. Like, she just goes off on her. Yeah. Like, repeatedly obtaining terrible things. Even uh-huh. when they're in the theater. Yeah. yeah. When there could be people around. That could there probably you. are, yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently, Mike and Lacey used to date, and Katie's not over it. So she's just ripping on her in the theater before the show starts, and Mike is clearly pissed off about it, just repeatedly telling her to shut up. When the lights come back up, though, the the play is unanimously shit upon by everybody except for Chip, who's like just the most like optimistic guy of this bunch. Uh, JT and Mora decide that they're going to walk home rather than ride with everybody else. And back at the house, everybody stands around a birthday cake for JT with a guitar on it. And they're nervous about celebrating his birthday because he's turning 30. And uh, they're worried that it's a big deal for him that he's not going to be he's leaving his 20s i'm a little confused about the argument that they're having though because they're arguing whether or not to take the guitar off the yeah. cake and i'm like is this have anything to do with the fact that he's turning 30 or yeah. that they think he's a failed musician or it's what i mean like i'm not sure exactly what they're implying also the way that this guitar is applied to this cake it's a very thin layer of frosting I doubt you'd be able to take it off without leaving a guitar-shaped <laughs> hole in the top of the cake. <laughs> you ate the Oni. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we never even see his reaction to this cake. But they're all making a big deal like, oh my god, he's turning 30. I remember that was a huge deal for me. I don't know if this was like, if it was a bigger deal in the 80s to turn 30. I feel like it's not anymore. I don't know. I'm also confused as to what age he actually is because here they they seem to be insisting that he's 30. And later, I'm pretty sure Francis says that he's 35. Oh, it's maybe. I don't know. very or, confusing. Or at least she was projecting that he's going to be failed, a failed musician at oh, 35. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, everybody plays charades for a bit, and Chip doesn't do well, but he's given a pretty shit clue. So I don't blame him for not communicating. What was it? Far Tortuga. Uh, far Tortuga to everybody in yeah. charades. That seems like a difficult yeah. one. Well, it also seems like they were intentionally picking really pretentious and difficult titles. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it wasn't like Star Wars or, I mean, not that you have to be make it that simple, but it, it just seems like they were picking things that for sure not a lot of people would get. Especially th- people outside their friend group. Yeah. Like this is a this is a Ron proof charades clue bucket. Yeah. But I think this falls into the category of why this is a, a snobby group of people right. that we're following here. But to expect someone to be able to communicate Tortuga as part of your clue prior to the Pirates of the Caribbean movies <laughs> is just unfair. But even even if you started doing I I I was I was in the same boat as Chip and I'm like I I couldn't do this. I know what Far Tortuga is and I can't do this. But he gets JT to say nearsighted and he doesn't point to him and be like no 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 like the opposite of that like he doesn't he doesn't jump on the word near when it comes up which I feel like he should have made a point of that but he doesn't. Sure. They can't even get the word far let alone Tortuga which was never going to happen. <laughs> They listened to a lot of dinosaurs. That's yeah. true. <laughs> I was like, I was actually really impressed with their dinosaur knowledge. <laughs> Later in bed, Katie and Mike make fun of Irene's ex, Dwight, who is apparently a rampant drug user, that he like literally just stole medicine from other people because yeah. he wanted to get high off of it. I think I used to eat all our medicine. <laughs> Dwight. Mm, Dwight. What a loser. She thought you could help him. <laughs> Three years of cold turkey couldn't have helped him. Dude was a walking drugstore. He even used to eat her gantrosin when she had cystitis. <laughs> that he was stealing and eating because he thought it would get him high. Did it? 
<laughs> Are you going to try and find some? <laughs> what must I steal? <laughs> uh, they seem to think Irene and Chip are a better fit than than Irene and Dwight were, or even Irene and JT ever were. And we cut to JT and Mora talking in the living room, and she asks if JT ever thought about her romantically when she and Jeff were together. And he is worried to jump on this. He thinks it might be like bait for a trap. And he's just like, I don't know if you're talking, you know, metaphorically or if this is a, if you're testing me or what. But, and he eventually admits that, yes, he, he has thought of her that way, but he never would have acted on it when she was with Jeff because it just wasn't an option. And then they s- decide together to make out for a bit and make plans to bone very quietly so as to not draw attention. <laughs> to themselves uh katie is worried that all of their friend couples are breaking up uh and mike tries to assure her that everything is fine she gets up to use the bathroom and notices jt having sex with someone on the floor of the living room but she can't tell who and immediately ducks back into the room and tells mike that uh she saw this coming last year because she knew that francis was very interested in jt and mike says oh i saw it coming even before that and then they're like, well, I hope Mora's asleep because I would hate for her to have to listen to all this. And then we cut to the living room and see that Mora, as we already knew, is the one with JT. And Francis, who we now know has had a crush on JT for multiple years, is pretending to sleep while listening to him have sex with Mora. Yeah, I don't care how quiet you think you're being. That's just super mm-hmm. rude to do that. Yeah. They should have invited her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the polite thing to do in this situation. There you go. Or what is it like you you hang a tie on the doorknob but they just hang a tie around her it's like what are you, what are you doing so just, just letting you don't know don't disturb us <laughs> katie finally heads out to piss and realizes her mistake over breakfast the next morning everyone shares a lot of bathroom humor about intestinal troubles of the past and chip is ver- put very off his breakfast he doesn't want to eat while everyone's talking about their friends and their farts uh, we get a lot of unnecessary background information about how these people met each other over a game of volleyball uh, while Chip is being brought up to speed, basically. And then Jeff gets into town, and he stops at Ron's gas station, and Ron says, Oh, hey, are you still with Laura? Probably meaning Mora. And he says, Oh, yeah. Back at the volleyball game, Jeff shows up and announces that he left his folks thing early and that they'll understand. Mike and Katie aren't sure how to handle this as the hosts of this event. And Katie worries that Mora and JT may have jumped the gun. We cut to JT serenading everybody with a folk song about being young and wanting the girls in porno mags. Sitting here thumbing through Hustler magazine Looking at the pictures They don't seem obscene to me I'm 21 21 years old and I never had no one I ain't much to look at brain's kind of slow I dropped out of high school and went to work for Texaco oh just a pumping their gas out by the interstate I'm 21 years old 21 and I ain't never been nowhere I want a girl that I could curl up with and love oh lord above know what I mean I want a girl to want me like I want the girls I've seen in Hustler magazine. Yeah, so JT is not a good singer. Correct. Yeah, he's not a talented musician or singer. And his songs are kind of Immature and garbage, yeah. Before a game of basketball, JT comes clean to Jeff about him and Mora, which I feel like in an ordinary movie, this would power the tension of the next, like, 10 scenes but instead here it's like the second he gets back he's like oh by the way i slept with your ex-girlfriend immediately right (laughs) and so that lets all the tension out of the scene and it's just for them to come to terms with at this point katie tells mora that she's worried about her and jt because jt's a loser and what she's doing is a big mistake (laughs) she's just like he's going nowhere and you're gonna regret this i just want you to know that but mora doesn't like it's not like she's she admits here that JT isn't like an end goal for her. Right. She he he was just there and she you know, she wanted somebody. So. Yeah. But she also admits that she's thought about it in the past. That this wasn't a this wasn't one hundred percent like, oh, there's a penis. It was like I've been kind of <laughs> well, waiting for this guy. Yeah, but it's definitely not 
it's something a, she wishes to pursue. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it's a penis that she knows. Yeah. <laughs> but Which is better than the, the penis you don't know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Francis tells Irene that she's really worried about JT because he's such a loser. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not going to succeed in life. Well, and, this is why she's when she says something about, like, you know, 35 and you know in in la yeah. and not not making it as a musician yeah she's like it's different when you're in your early 20s running across the country but when you're 35 and you have nothing to show for it uh, but irene is like vaguely defensive here because they used to date and so she doesn't want to look like somebody who dated a loser for a long time but uh, Wait, the... irene doesn't want to look like somebody who dated a loser yeah who dated a druggie named dwight for yep. a long time mm-hmm. <laughs> who, dr- who ate all of her medicine <laughs> Uh, the girls sit around and chat about their long-term plans for life while the guys play basketball for five straight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> this didn't need to happen. With that weird... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It sounded like Forbidden what Zone. That? What the is this music? music? Yeah. Isn't that part of the like the beginning of the Forbidden Zone music? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, or the beginning of uh, the Dilbert animated series yeah. opening. Right, Same difference. <laughs> a woman shows up with three kids and she's looking for her husband howie who said he was headed this way but must have joined the basketball game and after she leaves uh they're just blown away that this woman has three kids even though they're all boomers who probably grew up with like 10 siblings each uh the game ends when jt takes a pole to the face (laughs) and jeff apologizes to him for the injury after the game Back at the house, the girls are playing Clue while talking about whether or not they want kids and knowing that their time to decide is running out because after 35, you run into health issues. Your engine shut down. Right. Uh, Irene admits that she would like kids someday, but she has no idea with who and that maybe she'll just adopt later in life. We cut to everybody skinny dipping at a swimming hole. Yeah, okay, so why? Why what? Why are they skinny dipping? Why any scene in this movie? That's true. I was like, because they because they come there in shorts. I was like, why don't you just wear the shorts in the water? Well, it's obviously more comfortable to be naked than to wear shorts. I guess. Anywhere. I think we just wanted repetitive shots of penises jumping off of rocks. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like seeing penises <laughs> in ice cold water. <laughs> everybody's favorite <laughs> but they do actually make a comment of like oh this is what irene sees in chip yeah <laughs> so i guess the cold water was not a deterrent <laughs> yeah. if that's what shrinkage is doing imagine the the starter pistol <laughs> um jeff uh we have learned earlier and we mentioned again now works with people who are suffering from addiction and chip works with irene for the senator's office and the two of them argue about where the most good could be done for society in general and uh chip is getting very worked up about it because jeff's kind of baiting him to see how angry he can make him uh jt asks mike if he can borrow five bucks to get drunk with tonight because he's completely out of money jeff starts redressing and drops intentionally or unintentionally drops a small bag of heroin next to mike on the ground and he picks it up and he's like what the hell is this uh jeff says he got it from someone in the program but just the side of it terrifies Mike because anything you put into your body with a needle is too much for him, even with all the drugs they did as kids. Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like that is totally warranted. Like, I don't understand why he's hanging on to this because this is not like a casual drug that you would just try. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that, and Mora makes the point that he's showing all these tendencies from being with all these addicts all day, that he has all these other problems. And I feel like, He's almost getting to the point where he's going to try this as a result of that because he's he has all these addictive tendencies now. Yeah. Uh, we missed earlier uh, Ron Spiel uh, when, when they were talking about, like, what's he up to now? Oh, okay. Oh, he's, I think he says, I work at a methadone clinic. And Ron's like, oh, I once had a car that was a junkie for oil. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like it would run out of oil after I thought I had fixed it. Like, yeah. How is this a good analogy for methadone? It's clinic? basically the same thing. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Ron starts to follow Francis around and tell her about some pitch that he has for, I don't remember, something about a talk show snowmobile thing. Yeah, where he wants to have like a celebrity endorsement. Yeah. Um, but she's, she's not following at all. But he's, meanwhile, he's walking on top of other people's cars. Yeah. It seems very annoying. Uh, the friends all get stoned and head out to the bar together. JT and Irene declare a thumb war. 
Uh, so that's happening at the bar. Howie, the father of the three kids we saw earlier, is talking with them about a guy from high school who was always working on his car. And he compares that guy's love for his car to how he feels about his kids, that it's a lot of work, but that when he's out around town with them, that he thinks they're very cool and he hopes other people notices how cool his kids are. He's, he's proud. Yeah, he seems like a cool dad. JT and Jeff flirt with a pair of women at the bar. One of them is a music critic, so Jeff mentions JT's music career. Uh, Irene and Katie are talking about the influence that Irene has on the senator's platform, and she's very proud of the difference she's made. She says that she does have a small influence and is able to direct money to programs in the state that she thinks are important. Jeff suddenly launches into a very inside baseball description of different genres of music. She's uh, into it, though. Yeah, she's totally sucked into it. She, like, tracked her being like, whoa, you used, you said arpeggio. What? Well, and it's interesting because JT is the actual musician here, but has right. nothing intelligent to say about music. Yeah, because he doesn't actually probably know anything about <laughs> the actual art of the music. He's just kind of like, this chord sounds neat next to this chord. Yeah, he's not even very good at that. <laughs> They ask if he works in music, and he says drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're confused for a moment until he explains that he helps people get off drugs. And then JT starts to uh, sort of embellish it a lot. And he's like, oh, he's worked with all the most famous musicians in the world. He helped get them all off of drugs. They they call him the the cold turkey or something like that, that he helps everybody get off of these things and they're like well what about Jimi hendrix and he's like well you can't win them all like he works personally <laughs> with Jimi hendrix and he he didn't do the trick the girls step away for a minute to head to the bathroom and jeff tells jt that they're basically in there deciding which which one of them gets which guy but that's not what they say he says you know what they're doing in there and jt says uh number one or number two and he's like no they're trying to decide which one of us gets or which one gets which one of us and yeah. and and they've got number three on their minds yeah. I'm like wait a minute <laughs> my understanding of number three and your understanding of number three i don't think are the same hold on what's your understanding of number three <laughs> i think it's a combination of one and two you add those together <laughs> for me number three has always meant vomiting <laughs> really <laughs> which i think is what he means here what no. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, I, I, and also, you know, like this is bathroom code that we're talking about, yeah. not, but not bedroom code. Right, yeah. which is why I would not mix those Un metaphors. Unless they're talking about bases, third base? Are they talking <laughs> about third base? I don't know. Well, you can have sex in a bathroom. It's not physically <laughs> impossible. <laughs> JT performs on stage poorly. Mike, too, too many times. Yeah. There's like he goes through he goes through his entire repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> his repertoire of all six songs. There's also another woman performing with him, and I'm not clear on if this is one of the like she looks. I think so she's much... just one of the music friends. She's okay. she's not any of the Sakaka she... Seven. No. It's so hard to keep track because they all all the women in this movie look alike. <laughs> we get this quick moment of Mike, Howie, and Ron doing their impressions of monster truck commercials until Howie's wife calls and is like. You need to get back to the hotel. You're working the desk tonight. Sunday! 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 At Washington Valley Speedway, thrills, chills, and spills. Nitro burning funny cars. Joey Chitwood and his auto daredevil. Special appearance by Big Daddy Ross. You laugh, you scream, you cry. Sunday! Stocks and dragsters burning rubber in the biggest event of the season. Sunday! 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 Howie! What? It's your wife. Um, so he has to turn around and leave. Frances and Ron sit in a booth and talk about her experiences in medical school. Ron says that he's basically the town mechanic. Like, everybody knows if there's anything wrong with your car, you just go to him. Unless it's an oil problem, and then he'll probably fuck up your car and pretend it's the car's fault. But that's his whole reason. Like, he doesn't want to go to the city and be just another mechanic. He's like, here, he knows that when there's a problem, you go see Ron. Right. Like, he, he has a certain... He's, he has he's a reputation a, in the town of being like the honest big mechanic. fish in a small pond. Yeah, he doesn't want to go to a bigger pond. I get it. Frances asks what happened after high school, and she says it as uninsultingly as she can that Mike used to look up to you when you guys were in high school, and he says something about how basically his plan at one point was just high school sports, and that didn't work out. And he says that everybody knew it wasn't going to work out. Yeah, uh, but eventually he found out that it wasn't. JT finishes another song about being 21, and uh, nobody really <laughs> seems to respond to this music. Literally, like, two of the three songs that he's played so far have 
mention that the age of 21 in the chorus right. which if he's turning 30 these are old songs yeah. at this point <laughs> yeah it's like when you had um you have all these rock bands that are like like school's out for summer <laughs> it's like yeah. yeah school was out a long time ago <laughs> you don't even remember being at school uh, but you have to play this song every night suddenly mara and jeff are arguing very loudly and have captured the attention of the full bar Ron and Francis leave to check into the nearby hotel where Howie is back running the desk now. But not before they have a very awkward conversation that was not the way I feel like this should go. Because he offered to take her to the hotel. Yeah. And he said something to the effect of, we could kill two birds with one stone. And, you know, basically we could go have sex and you could look at my, uh, he says prostrate, <laughs> not prostate. Right, yeah. Um, which I think he's joking here, but she just goes along with and says, yeah, just don't call me Doc. And I'm just mm. like, why, first of all, why is Doc such an offensive nickname to you? And second of all, I wouldn't go along with that joke at all. Like, if <laughs> Well, she, she has already gotten this joke from Mike earlier where he's like, I wondered if you could check out my, and she's like, don't start with this. I don't need this right now. So uh, I think people have been making this joke to her all day. Like, oh, you're a doctor? Oh, well, then you can help me with my this or my that. So I, I think that she's just being friendly going along with the joke. But I also, I, she, because she mentioned how annoying him calling her doc is earlier. And I feel like it's just it's a, you know, a Bugs Bunny situation where he just, it feels cartoonish to refer to anybody as Doc, that she just is annoyed by it, that just call me by my name because you know me as a person. But they head, yeah, they head over to the hotel next door, ju I think just before this this fight breaks out, so they, they happen to miss all of it. In the bar, Mike talks Jeff down while JT tries to console Mora after their argument. Uh, they all head back to the lodge, and they notice something in the road and pull over. Apparently, it's a deer corpse that has been wrapped up or something. It was hunted illegally, and they're stopped looking at it in the road when the police show up and assume that they hunted this deer illegally and take them all down to the jailhouse. Yeah, it's not wrapped up. It's just got its legs tied up, which you mm -hmm. would do when you tie okay. it down to your car. Well, they all get dragged down, and they have to give statements and we have Jeff sitting in the chair reading a laundry list of prior arrests back from when they were all activists together. And uh, at the end of each charge, he says all charges dropped. So they never actually went to prison for anything that they did, but they were arrested many times in their youth. Mora has the identical address and arrest record as Jeff when she sits down in the chair. Next, a drunk guy is brought in and sat in the room with the Sakaka 7. After some conversation, they realize they know this guy, that he used to ref the games when they were kids, and he worked at some shoe factory that closed, so now he drinks for a living. And uh, all of them start sharing stories of their youth, and they tell Chip about when they were kids, and they got arrested in Secaucus on the way to a protest, and they ended up spending that whole night in a jail, calling themselves the Secaucus 7 as a joke. And quoting an old James Cagney movie, Salt of the Earth. We want a formula. We want a formula. Which, of course, brings to mind, I want that formula. <laughs> <laughs> I want that formula. Uh, the charges were dropped because the arresting officers in Secaucus had bundled the case so bad that they couldn't really hold them. And here they are also excused because Norman the drunk confesses that it was his deer that had just fell off of his car in the road. I don't know if they're implying that it actually was or he just decided he was going to take this one for the team so the kids could go home because yeah. he knew they didn't do it yeah i don't really so like we finally establish which one of these core group are considered the sakaka seven because we get this backstory here finally at the end of the film explaining the right. title yeah uh so it's definitely those original seven people and not chip and not Lacey and right. not ron and not howie and not all of these other people that yeah. have introduced themselves to the story yeah but they're not even all there when they do this explanation. Yeah, there's no yeah. scene with Francis all of the Sakaka 7 sitting there. Francis is not there. Yeah. But Chip is. Yeah. <laughs> I find that really annoying. Um, yeah, it is weird to not have all of the Sakaka 7 there to explain this story. On the way out of the building, Mike asks Jeff, hey, where'd you toss the heroin when we got arrested? And he's like, oh, I forgot all about it. It's still in my pocket. And Mike's like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, back at the house, Chip expresses disappointment to learn that Irene and Ron were ever together uh, because that grosses him out because Ron is a, a layman to him. Uh, JT and Jeff talk about JT's plans for Los Angeles. 
they suddenly hear someone throwing up and try to decide from the from the guttural noises and from splashing. From the number three noise? Yeah, the number three <laughs> sounds uh, who this is and eventually decide that it's Katie. JT asks Jeff if he's still mad about Mora, and he is. The next morning, they make a shit ton of eggs, but only Chip has the stomach to eat any of it, and they're all just watching him do it like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why aren't you throwing up? Uh, Frances returns from her walk of shame, and they all sing her a song as she comes in. Uh, Irene loans JT a bunch of money to get a foothold in Los Angeles, and he's terrified to accept it, but uh, she's really worried about him. But he doesn't accept it. Right. But in this first scene, it looks like he's going to get mm-hmm. like literally thousands of dollars she's trying to give mm-hmm. him so that he can get a start. And uh, we cut to Jeff and Mara talking about how they'll divide up their stuff in the house. And he's like, you take this key. You can come get your stuff whenever. And she's like, you keep the furniture. And he's like, I'll cancel your dental appointment. Like they're f- finishing up the business of breaking up. Uh, and then we cut back to JT and Irene and he's successfully talked her out of giving him the money because he wants to make it his own way. And if this doesn't work out for him, then it wasn't supposed to work out. But if it does, he wants to be able to come back and just spoil them with what he made on his own. He doesn't want them to have to invest in him and know that it's all his. Right. So he doesn't owe it to anyone but himself that he made it. Exactly. Uh, Irene and chip leave for a sudden task for the Senator and then Katie takes Mora and JT back to the bus stop at 6,000 salad bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff chops wood to avoid saying goodbye to anybody. And then we cut back to the bus stop where JT admits that he's just going to hitchhike from here because he can't afford a bus ticket. And Mora's like, I'll buy you the ticket. But it's not clear if he accepts this money, and he probably doesn't. I'm guessing he just hitchhikes from here. Uh, Jeff apparently leaves the lodge without saying anything to anybody. He just leaves a note behind that says, I'm sorry. I figured we were going to show up the next time we saw Jeff was going to be as a dead Yeah, body. that's kind of what I thought, like, too. Like, overdosed on heroin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, impossibly, as they're approaching, like, the tree stump, there's just, like, legs. and He's just like, laying inside somehow one he of the chops 6, himself salad up. salad bowls. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but he, uh, yeah. When Mike and Katie head back into the house, Francis is still asleep on the couch. And Katie says, let her sleep late so that she has no choice but to stay the night again. Because she's still asleep, and it's like early afternoon at this point uh, then katie wonders aloud what they're going to do with all the leftover eggs and we're at the bottom of page 100 let's just call it a movie guess we're done yeah mm-hmm. that's the end of the film writer director john sales his first screenplay was piranha in 1978 this was his second of three features this year between alligator and battle beyond the stars next year he'll have the howling again for dante he also wrote Brother from Another Planet, Clan of the Cave Bear, and more recently, The Spiderwick Chronicles. And he plays Howie in this film, the guy with the three kids. You know, this is nothing like those other movies. No, it's yeah. not. I mean, I get why it didn't like sell and he had to make it himself. But I'm, I, I kind of wonder what was so compelling about this idea that he's like, I think, I'm going to invest in this. I think he wanted to be a director. Yeah, but in terms of what you pick to be the thing that you direct what was it about this movie that he's like this is the one this is i can pay for it out of pocket that's what it was you can't make alligator for sixty thousand dollars let alone battle beyond the stars i guess if if roger corman can't make battle beyond the stars with sixty thousand dollars then nobody can (laughs) uh maggie renzi played katie uh she was the partner of director john sales at the time she was also the film's location manager and assistant editor uh adam lafever La Favre was JT. <laughs> he's probably the most recognizable face in the cast. He's played seven characters in seven Law and Orders. He was Raleigh Thorpe in Bonfire of the Vanities, Sean Fry in Rounders, Congressman Healy in The Manchurian Candidate. That's the remake, obviously. And he plays the dad in about a thousand commercials, but he was also Jay Baruchel's dad in She's Out of My League, which is a funny part for him. And then David Strathern was Ron. This was his first feature film credit. He was Edward R. Murrow in Good Night and Good Luck. He's William Seward in or William Seward in Lincoln. He's Pierce Patchett in L.A. Confidential. Admiral William Stenz in Godzilla and Godzilla King of the Monsters. And he played Arthur Spiderwick in the Spiderwick Chronicles, also from Sales. Uh, nobody else here had a second credit. Wow. <laughs> because they were all actor friends of Sales's who did mostly stage work before quitting to do other jobs. I think the acting in this movie was great. I agree. There was nothing wrong with the acting in this movie. It feels very natural yeah. because 
that's how you, he cast it was just people that talk to each other like they're friends because they probably literally were friends yeah which is funny that these people didn't do anything after this movie where we have so many movies this year where the people have you know dozens of credits per actor and mm-hmm. none of them were any good <laughs> <laughs> uh did you mention chip i didn't oh because he's got a lot of credits oh does he yeah like oh let's see uh well he uh is he was on chicago fire okay 11 episodes uh great as the same character or 11 different characters (laughs) same character (laughs) um he's got a he's got a a, quite a list of things like the the game plan monk and my uh 256 episodes of nypd blue okay so a lot of tv stuff tv TV regulars yeah the rage 2 the Rage 2, is that... Oh, sorry, The Carrie Rage. 2, The Rage? Carrie 2, The Rage, sorry. <laughs> That's an interesting movie. Probably didn't need to happen. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I think that has a They Might Be Giants song on the soundtrack, though. Because for some reason, it, at one time in my life, I knew every movie that had a They Might Be Giants song on the soundtrack. Because I care a lot about that band. Um, yeah, uh, this was this was a decent movie as far as like these types of movies go. Um, everybody seemed like believable and a well-written character. I, there was nobody who I didn't believe could exist in the real world. And uh, there just wasn't a lot going on. So it suffers from that. Yeah. And also the dialogue, while clearly getting across the point that these are intelligent people who have like thoughts on important issues, uh, it's not entertaining conversation. Yeah, well, none of it's that's because none of it's relevant. Yeah, and the drama the drama never really gets out of hand, with the exception of the one argument between Jeff and Mora, which just boils down to we don't love each other anymore yeah. and we're upset about it. Yeah. yeah, and there could have been a lot of other tension, like you said earlier, when yeah, yeah. By the way, I slept with the woman who was gonna be your wife. Yeah, yeah. that could have had like Jeff could have been punching JT in the face and mm-hmm. and it could have completely fallen apart. But he apologizes and they're civil to each other for the rest of the movie. Right. Literally nobody has an arc in this movie because yeah. even Jeff and Mora, who we hear change over the course of the, you know, like they used to be like this. Yeah. When we first meet them and when they They've leave, already changed. They, they have, they're already yeah. going through their change here. Yeah. And, and while we do get a lot of dialogue about their thoughts on things, it's never enough to really understand what those thoughts are. Like when they're, when they're after they're skinny dipping, um, he says, I just don't think that the Senator can do it. Well, you don't understand all the factors. It's just like, what are you even talking about? You're not talking about anything. You're just using words. They're just trying to show that there's two different kinds of people in this friend group that there's like the, the socialist activist characters. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people that are trying to work within the system to make things better. And so there's going to be friction there. But they don't really delve into any specifics. It's just right. kind of like, you can't make a difference. Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. The oh, end. Very generic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't hate it. But uh, but there's not a lot here. Um, up or down, Jess? Oof. That's a hard one. It is. Like, like I said, there's nothing particularly wrong about this film, aside from the fact that it doesn't really have a story, which in and of itself isn't wrong. It's just not my kind of movie. So I feel like that that means I'm going to give it a down because it's not like I would tell anybody to watch this movie. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a down because while I appreciate what it is, um, I think that there and, – and with the benefit of probably this movie coming out first, you have people like the Duplass brothers making these, you know, super low-budget – movies with just a few characters that are super entertaining from beginning to end with one location and just conversation well those movies are super packed with an emotional journey right but even movies like the puffy chair which is literally just two brothers going to get a chair to move it somewhere like that movie is enjoyable and i and i would rewatch it right now if it were just starting whereas with this movie there's really not enough going on to capture my interest for the whole thing but yeah, all the all the mumblecore stuff like funny haha is another great one, or all the the woman that just passed away, um, shoot, what's her name, uh, Hump Day and I didn't know she passed away. Yeah, she was she was pretty young. Lynn Shelton, uh, she directed Hump Day, Your Sister's Sister, Laggies. Um, she did a bunch of stuff, and it was all very simple, super low budget, but extremely interesting. 
and uh, I feel like this could have been punched up a lot and not cost any more money. How did she die? I don't know, actually. What's that other one where they're digging in the backyard um, with Duplass? They're D- at this house on the hill. Digging and- for fire? Digging for fire. There that's you go. Joe Swanberg? Yeah, Swanberg. That's another guy. Yeah, Joe he Swanberg does all these super yeah. low-budget, single-location movies with ensemble casts that are just fascinating from mm-hmm. beginning to end. She died of a previously undiagnosed blood disorder. Huh. That's a shame. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't know that. But I would recommend you go check those movies out instead of this one. <laughs> yeah, but I would say it's a down for me. Up or down, Richard? Oh, this is a down. I have no <laughs> misgivings or no no hesitations on giving this movie a down. I, I, I was looking it up. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what are people saying about this movie? It's like, oh, it's really highly praised by a lot of circles. Yeah. So I found one article <laughs> that just was titled "The Sakaka Seven is not a good movie," <laughs> and I was like, okay, at least one person out there is <laughs> speaking my language. <laughs> uh, but. Yeah, it's it's pretty universally liked and highly critically rated. And I was just like, okay, well, not my cup of tea. I didn't care for it. I have no problem with how it was made. And like I said, the acting that felt these conversations, it's like felt they were conversations. But I I need something. I need to move from one place to another in a logical way or feel like I've gained something. I didn't gain anything from getting a glimpse into these people's lives. Yeah. Uh, it it was that was it i feel like this was probably the the close group of friends that john sales went to college with sure in his mind like that he he wrote about people he he knew and that's what this movie is about yeah and i think that this movie is probably really appealing to people who identify with these characters but also uh, uh, where did you guys watch it i watched it on amazon i think yeah, I watched it on Amazon. I didn't. I watched it on Plex. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, Did I? This one was on Plex. The was other it on one Plex? was on Amazon. So, oh, oh, yeah. Battle, Battle okay. Beyond the Stars. I, I watched it on Amazon. Well, there was a whole bit before this about how the film was being restored and archived. And it, they had all these pre credits about the film restoration and film archiving. Like, Well, it was done. just, it got inducted into the Library of Congress recently. Yeah. Or I guess not super recently, but. But also that sales had never really intended this f- to have a wide release. Right. He wasn't even thinking of it as a feature film. Yeah. This was just a little passion project that he wanted to do. And and that's how I think it should have been. But where's the passion? <laughs> this movie uh, doesn't have anything. I, I think it has enough. It's, it's just a love letter to that generation. And it's a coming of age thing. It's a coming of middle age thing. I guess. Can we talk about how terrible the title is? Because not knowing anything about this movie, I was expecting it to either be like a political thriller or like a western. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, it, it's just, just. It also feels like a sequel because you say the return of the Sakaka Seven. Yeah, none of these things are true. Well, they're returning. They were gone for a but long time. But they return every no, year. No, I'm just saying none of the things are <laughs> yeah, true. This, this, this movie that, could have been also. Well, that's two. why it's called it's Seven. <laughs> <laughs> They've returned seven times now not about the number of people yeah. no it is and actually <laughs> <laughs> in the imdb trivia i think uh, there was one point that said this is the only film with the movie sakakis in the title <laughs> it's just like th- what an interesting bit of trivia <laughs> <laughs> just a random city somewhere i feel like he could have picked a better random city not that it needed to be a more like well-known or populous city it just needed to also not be sound like a word that makes you think of things like politics or western I or think something that, i think that was intentional <laughs> to have it sound like politics because they are political activists the, and this is just a sequel to a movie about political activists you know this is this is the follow-up to a small circle of friends or you know whatever it's just like a, oh we're getting old and getting ready to have kids now we're we're different than we were back when we were in love triangles and making bad art <laughs> that's fair <laughs> except for jt who is still making, still making bad art, art. <laughs> with well, a passion. I did enjoy this more than A Small Circle of Friends, yeah. I guess. It was less obnoxious than that movie. Yeah. Um, where's this going letterbox-wise for you? Uh, it's it's near the middle. It's um, it's below our windows threshold. It's in the, 
I think early 70s here in my list for the year. It is below those lips, those eyes, and above how to beat the high cost of living. All right. Richard? Um, I have this pretty pretty low. Uh, it's in the 70s for me as well. Uh, but for me, it's going to be below the kidnapping of a president and above the fiendish plot of Dr. Fu Manchu. Nice. Uh, for me, this is just above the windows threshold, literally right above windows and below Herbie Goes Bananas, which isn't super low on mine. It's probably still in my top half because I actually kind of like these little character pieces, even if it's just dialogue and the characters aren't changing because at least that I can laugh at the jokes and understand what the people are talking about. And I care about the people because I just care about interesting people. But there's not enough happening. Um, it does, It's not the best sales movie of the year, so I can't put it above Alligator. Um, but yeah, I think that's about everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash Vintage Video Podcast. Because this is our first episode of the month again, I wanted to remind our listeners about our Patreon campaign for anyone who hasn't had time to check it out. Vintage Video will always be free to listen to, but if it's worth it to you, a donation as small as a buck a month is greatly appreciated. We are into September now. We've been doing the show for eight months. This is our 103rd episode, and we're averaging close to 13 titles a month. We expect to cover about 14 a month on average over the course of the year, which means for the buck a month tier, you're donating seven or eight cents per episode. We also have a $5 tier, about $0.36 cents per film, which includes a shout-out on the show, a monthly exclusive episode reviewing a title from the 70s, and a hand in choosing each month's film. We've recorded eight so far, and for October, our second-tier members are choosing between eight titles. Little Foss and Big Halsey, a biker dramedy from Night of the Juggler's fired director Sidney Fury, and starring Robert Redford and Michael J. Pollard. Rabbit Run an adaptation of the first installment of John Updike's Pulitzer Prize-winning series, starring James Caan, Kerry Snodgrass, Jack Albertson, and Henry Jones. Wizard of Gore, Herschel Gordon Lewis's splatter classic about a morbid magician whose audience volunteers keep turning up dead. The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, Billy Wilder's slight parody of Holmes' story that served as the tonal inspiration for the Benedict Cumberbatch series. The Twelve Chairs, Mel Brooks' period comedy about a hunt for lost treasure. Trog, starring Joan Crawford, trying to communicate with the missing link found in an active volcano. The Great White Hope, a biopic about boxer Jack Johnson and his controversial first marriage. And I Walk the Line, John Frankenheimer's neo-noir drama starring Gregory Peck and Tuesday Weld, each of which celebrate their 50th anniversaries this October. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in, you can find our campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. If not, I hope you'll at least do us the honor of continuing to listen. Thanks again, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Battle Beyond the Stars, which IMDb describes like so. A young farmer sets out to recruit mercenaries to defend his peaceful planet, which is under threat of invasion by the evil tyrant Sater and his armada of aggressors. We leave you now with the trailer for Battle Beyond the Stars. Ruthless invaders, a defenseless planet. Battle beyond the stars. A lone youth escapes on a last ditch mission that begins at the edge of the universe. of a boy who finds more than he expected. (laughs) And all he can handle. Does your species have kissing? Oh, yes. We have that. Try one. That's a hot dog. It comes from Earth. Do you like it? There's no dog in this. Mm -mm. Soybean meal? Niacin, dextrose, 
And sodium nitrate flavoring. That's what we call meat back home. Battle Beyond the Stars. Starring Richard Thomas, George Papard, Robert Vaughn, John Saxon, <laughs> A battle beyond time, beyond space. Nice and fire! That ends in a desperate gamble. They'll be able to board us. It won't make any difference. Get that hatch open! No! Battle beyond the stars.